Uh, good afternoon. Welcome back to Grand Rounds today. Please remember to uh, sign the attendance record at the back of the auditorium. And also, please remember to fill out and return the program evaluations to give us at the or in the CME committee any ideas you might have in regards to future topics or future speakers. Um, today, it's uh, my pleasure uh, to introduce Dr. John Ely. Uh, Dr. Ely is a family practitioner and geriatrician. Uh, he also holds a Master of Science in Public Health. He uh, is a Professor Emeritus in Family Practice at the University of Iowa, and uh, he has researched and uh, written uh, s uh, extensively on the subject of diagnostic error, and uh, we're very pleased that he was uh, able to accept our invitation today to provide us with an introduction to diagnostic error, and uh, uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. John Ely. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, this slide and the next slide, I think we can skip pretty quickly. If I can make them go, that is. He said the top button, this is technology. Somebody else did that, I didn't do that. We can skip that one too. Ah, now it's working. <clears throat> so um, these are the objectives, just two of them. Um, <clears throat> One, was the, one is that uh, hopefully at the end of this talk you'll be able to describe the most common cause of diagnostic errors and the other is to describe a potential change you might make in your own practice to help prevent diagnostic errors. So if I was gonna ask you, um, if you were to go out and study a bunch of physicians and uh, ask them to describe a diagnostic error that they had made or that they were familiar with and then ask them, uh, what do you think caused that? Uh, what, are the, what are some of the causes that might come up or that they, they might uh, describe to you? Not necessarily the most common one, which we'll talk about in a minute, but does anybody have any thoughts about the kinds of things that might come up? Oh, I should tell you, I'm a little hard of hearing and I only have one ear because <clears throat> I had a labyrinthectomy, so I have no idea where the sound is coming from. So whoever said whatever you said, please say it again. Haste, right. Haste, uh, not only diagnostic errors, but uh, all kinds of errors. Haste is a big one. Anything else? Fatigue, right. You, these are actually uh, good uh, guesses because haste and fatigue and the third one might be distraction. You're distracted by an angry patient that you just saw or an, you, the fact that you're behind on your clinic schedule or whatever it is, which you're gonna do that evening. Those are, those are three big uh, areas of uh, big problem areas. But they're not the most common cause and we'll talk about that in a minute. So first, I guess we should define what we mean by diagnostic error, and there are lots of definitions. <clears throat> it's actually pretty problematic defining diagnostic error. It's a big problem in terms of uh, researching diagnostic errors is to get a good definition. And this is a popular one. There are others, but this one says a diagnosis that is wrong, delayed, or never made. And um, that seems okay on the surface. However, when you dig into this, uh, it can be pretty difficult to really distinguish what's an error and what's not. Because wrong, well, if I say somebody has a viral URI and they actually have viral bronchitis, uh, that's wrong, but does it really matter? Probably not, or not a lot. And so what we usually think about when we're talking about diagnostic errors is bad diagnostic errors, ones that result in the patient's death or morbidity or severe disability. Delayed, again, that's a problem because what's delayed? How delayed is it? I mean, diagnostic, uh, diagnosis is a, uh, occurs over time, right? We don't always make the diagnosis at the first clinic visit. So if you had unrealistic expectations, you might expect every doctor to make the correct diagnosis the first time they see the patient. But a lot of times we use time to our advantage to follow a patient along and decide what tests do they need today, what do I need to rule out today, what can I put on the back burner as being not very likely, but uh, I can't forget about it, that kind of thing. 
and never made um, <clears throat> gets to what we mean by never. So does never mean that you never make it until the autopsy or you never make it and it self-resolves or what? Um, so <clears throat> this, this whole issue of defining diagnostic error is really uh, problematic. <clears throat> so I'm going to give you an example uh, of what uh, of one of my own diagnostic errors, and this occurred uh, several years ago. I was uh, on the inpatient service at the University of Iowa and uh, working with a couple of residents, and we were called to see a patient in the emergency room with a diabetic foot ulcer that was not responding to outpatient antibiotics. He had a low-grade fever, uh, the wound. This is not his foot, but it looked very much like this uh, patient's foot. And uh, so the idea was that he would be transferred to the emergency room, we would see him there, and then admit him for switch from oral antibiotics to IV antibiotics seemed very straightforward. We did a history and physical. He had some other problems that were uh, unrelated. He did have diabetes. and. Uh, uh, so we were getting ready to admit him, writing, writing the orders, and uh, uh, on the way, <clears throat> we were all done, ready to leave the emergency room and go to the next patient, you know, go make rounds in the afternoon. And he, he said as we were walking out, uh, I wonder if you could just check my hemorrhoids sometime, because they've been kind of bothering me. And we said, oh, sure, uh, I took out a, a card, a checklist of things I uh, want to do, uh, you know, labs that I need to check or orders that I need to write or actually have the resident write. And um, so I put um, check hemorrhoids on this card. And we, we were kind of in a public area of the emergency room. It, it, we could have examined his hemorrhoids. Uh, we could have pulled the curtain and made it fairly private, but it was a room that has five beds in it, and the, the curtains are often not that great. So I just said, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll check your hemorrhoids later. So we went uh, home, didn't check them that night, and uh, um, the resident on call that night got a call from the nurses around 2 in the morning and said that your patient's blood pressure is 80 over 40. So the resident goes up and says, and you know, confirms that, figures, well, my goodness, he must have um, sepsis, um, septic shock. And so the resident called the uh, MICU team, the MICU team, and said, we've, we've got this patient who's uh, shocky and think he needs to come get pressers in the emergency room. So they, they accepted him. He was examined again in the, in the uh, intensive care unit. Uh, they started pressers. Blood pressure came up. Uh, I can't remember if they changed antibiotics. But then uh, later that morning, this was 2 in the morning, so later that morning when the fellow was making rounds, he said uh, he wondered if somebody could check his hemorrhoids. And the fellow was the first one to do a rectal exam. Uh, I didn't do it. My residents didn't do it. The MICU residents didn't do it. The fellow did it. And he had massive Fournier's gangrene. Uh, and, uh, you know, huge red perineum swelling. I can only describe it because I didn't see it except post-op. In fact, I didn't even see it post-op. I just read all the notes. Uh, the surgeons had to debride his whole perianal area. They had to remove the back half of his scrotum. Uh, he was in the burn unit to heal his wounds for the next three months. Uh, delusional. Um, huge, bad problem. Uh, th this is not the only error I've made, unfortunately. It's not even the most severe one. I've had s patients die from errors I've made, um, and kids die from errors I've made. But I think it has some uh, instructional value in terms of some things we'll talk about in a minute. <clears throat> 
So one, there's basically three things I want to talk about. One is how commonly do diagnostic errors occur, the second is what causes them, and the third is what might we do to help prevent them. And we don't know how often they occur, but there are some hints from previous studies. Um, and the, the first <coughs> row in this table is a estimate, actually, rather than a study. It's an estimate uh, from a guy named Arthur Elstein, who's not a physician, he's a PhD psychologist. He worked in Chicago for a long time, and he studied how doctors make uh, diagnoses. That's what he did his whole life. He's retired now. Um, and he wrote this chapter in the book that's in the uh, far right. It's right for you and right for me. Um, and said, nobody really knows how often doctors make a diagnostic error, but it's probably about 15% of the time. This was just sort of a off the top of his head guess. Uh, the other way to kind of get at this is to look at autopsy studies. Obviously, there's a big bias with that. Not everybody who dies gets an autopsy. Not everybody who has a diagnosis dies. Well, they all die, but not from the error. Um, and there was a big meta-analysis done by a guy named uh, Shojania, who's from Canada. Um, and this was reviewing autopsies, thousands of autopsies, from the years when we used to do a lot of autopsies, to try to see how often the clinical diagnosis differed from the autopsy diagnosis. And there were 24% 24, 24 of these autopsies, uh, of these thousands of autopsies, um, were associated with an error, meaning that the clinical diagnosis was different from the autopsy diagnosis. Not only different, this wasn't just some little thing that was added on, this was why the patient died. So the clinical diagnosis was wrong in terms of the cause of death. And then class one means if you had made the right diagnosis, you likely could have saved the patient's life. So that happens 7% of the time. They've also uh, studied the incidence of diagnostic error by using standardized patients. So they'll take a patient with COBD and have them see a general internist to this particular study. And um, uh, how often do they make uh, diagnostic errors? Things like diabetes, depression, COPD, and that's about 13% of the time, so very close to Arthur Elstein, and then they've looked at malpractice claims. Again, a big bias. I mean, these, this isn't a random sample of patients. Uh, this is, these are patients who are associated with a malpractice suit. And it turns out that diagnostic errors are the most common cause of malpractice suits. Not only are they the most common cause, they, they're the, the, um, they lead to the highest monetary settlements and they lead to the worst uh, outcomes. So more deaths, more permanent disability from diagnostic errors as opposed to treatment errors. What we don't have is a study that would really tell us what the incidence is. And to do that, you would follow real patients. You'd see them in the emergency room with the emergency room doctor, and you'd follow them up for the next month or six months and see what they really had. There are no studies like that, and it's, it's fairly obvious, I think, why there are no studies like that. It's a lot of work to follow somebody up. You, if you call them on the phone, they won't answer their phone. They could have been seen at a different hospital. You have no idea where they went. You have no idea, really, wh how many diagnoses are correct and how many are wrong. This is an estimate from Hardeep Singh, who is in San Antonio, studying is probably the most prolific researcher of diagnostic errors, and he estimates diagnostic errors affect more than 12 million Americans each year and likely cause more harm to patients than all other medical errors combined. So the other kinds of errors, of course, would be treatment errors, surgical errors, medication errors. Um, there, there's a lot of pressure, actually, to try to come up with a figure. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with several years ago, probably a couple of decades ago, the Institute of Medicine uh, had a big uh, conference and uh, 
came and wrote a book uh, called uh, To Err is Human, and in that book they said medical errors uh, probably uh, probably um, are associated with 98,000 deaths per year. Well, I'm sorry, I think it's 98,000 serious errors per year, and um, it would be the equivalent of two jumbo jets crashing every day in the United States. Very commonly used figure, congressmen get it, um, and part of what we're trying to do is get funding to fund this problem, which is mostly being ignored, not only by us, but by Congress. Um, and so there's a lot of pressure to try to get a number, and this is one number. One of the problems with studying diagnostic errors is it's all done in hindsight. And um, all of it. Nobody determines whether an error was made in foresight. Um, malpractice works that way. Um, morbidity and mortality conferences work that way. Research studies work that way. It's always in hindsight, which gives the judge, whether it's yourself or your colleague or the malpractice plaintiff's attorney or the patient, it gives them a unfair advantage because you're not there when you really have to make the decisions. These are some quotes by Robert Weirs, who is an emergency room physician in Miami, or was. He, ac he actually died a few years ago. <clears throat> but he studied this issue, and he said, hindsight and outcome bias are pre-conscious and cannot be overcome by simply willing ourselves to ignore them. So even if you try to be objective, you can't do it. It's part of human nature to take into account the outcome of what happened when you're making a decision about whether the physician did a good job in diagnosis. Because it's not all the physician's fault, but uh, if you try to point, well, first of all, sometimes it's nobody's fault. Occasionally it's the patient's fault. Occasionally it's a system fault. But if there's fault, it's almost always the physician's fault, unlike other kinds of errors that we can blame on the system. It's much easier to talk about system problems than it is about personal problems. But this is a doctor problem. This is not a system problem. So the second quote, external observers convert complex and confusing histories into more linear, more certain, and less ambiguous narratives that provide a sort of delusional clarity. And physicians are con condemned to live in the future, not in the past. So now we're going to talk about the causes. And this is a study done of malpractice claims. Again, big bias here. I mean, I, most errors don't ever go to court. Most, most errors, period, and most diagnostic errors never wind up as malpractice cases. Um, so the most common cause in this study of 122 claims, uh, actually it was 79 claims involving diagnosis, was cognitive biases, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and then the other causes, uh, less common communication errors, system factors, patient factors. A communication problem might be, well, whose patient is this? Am I just covering for Dr. Kitchell, or am I taking over this patient? Um, it's 2 o'clock in the morning. I don't really, this isn't really my patient. This is Dr. Kitchell's patient. Um, so I'm not going to do anything drastic here. I feel somewhat less responsible. I just need to get them to 6 in the morning or whenever Dr. Kitchell makes rounds. I just need to tide them over. Uh, workload, so emergency room too busy. Atypical presentation, uh, you know, like the first case of AIDS, uh, the first case of Legionnaire's disease. Or a patient I saw in Lake City where I used to work who came in with bilateral ear pain and his ear exam was normal. Uh, he had no other pain anywhere else, just his ears. And I just could not find anything wrong with his ears. And uh, so I said, well, I don't know what's wrong. Everything looks okay. I'm going to let you go home. Here's some ibuprofen. 
Hopefully it'll just go away. Well, his wife called that afternoon and said he died at home. So um, I don't know what he had, but I suspect he had an MI. He would had no chest pain, no shoulder pain, no jaw pain, just bilateral ear pain. So was I to blame? Yes. Um, I probably wouldn't make that mistake again. Uh, we should teach our residents and our medical students that bilateral ear pain, one of the things on the differential is an MI, which it is. Um, but, you know, there are atypical presentations where you can say, well, maybe the doctor wasn't completely at fault. Not that I'm trying to get out of responsibility for that patient. I had another patient, but I won't. If I start talking about my past errors, uh, we won't get through this talk, because I have too many of them. Okay, so people that study how doctors think, and actually how anybody thinks, kind of divides the way we think into two different processes. There's system one and system two. If I ask you what's four times six, you probably don't have to think about that very long. You can just tell me. I hope I don't have to think about it too. It's 24, right? Isn't that right? 24. If I ask you what's 47 times 63, you could actually do this in your head with your eyes closed, no pencil and paper, not even looking at 47 times 63. The reason I know you could do it is because I did it yesterday, and I got it right. Although a few months ago when I gave this talk, I got it wrong, because it's very hard to do. Um, but you can do it. If you're tying your shoes, you're using system one process. If you're trying to figure out how to fix this broken cello, which my granddaughter broke, uh, I needed to use system two. How am I going to fix this cello? It's already been broken once, and the guy that fixed it put a dowel, which doesn't show on this picture. He put a dowel through that broken cello, through the, through the neck. And then she broke it again. So now what am I going to do? I could put a metal rod in there, but that may change the sound coming from the cello. So lots of decisions. This is not just, you know, four times six. This is thinking hard about something. And in the medical world, if you see the patient on the left on the top, most physicians are going to use system one to make that diagnosis. In fact, if you start using system two, you're probably going to get it wrong. If you don't make a snap decision about that patient, you're probably going to get it wrong. And the diabetic foot ulcer is fairly obvious. But the kid on the right, I would have to think about that kid. Um, I would ask questions. I would stall. You know, did he have a new detergent? I think that's the most worthless question in the world, except we ask it every time. Uh, did you do something new? Does he have a new sweater, a new T-shirt, um, is a new medicine? Does he have a fever? You know, I would have to think, check him all over. What could this be? Same with the person on the bottom. So the person on the top, the little person on the top, has hives, and the person on the bottom has measles. But these are not, at least for me, they're not sort of system one type early recognition. This, by the way, this used to be called, these people on the left used to be called pattern recognition, and the process you go through on the right is called hypothetical deductive model. But now we call them system one and system two. So these are system one problems. These cognitive biases that we talk about are system one problems. Anchoring bias, confirmation bias, search satisficing, diagnostic momentum. These are faulty thinking processes that physicians have. Anchoring bias, <clears throat> when you see a patient with uh, a cold, um, and you think, well, could it be pneumonia? Probably not. Could it be a pulmonary embolus? Probably not. Um, 
but now he's a little short of breath. Well, I still think it's a cold. He's not really that short of breath. His respiratory rate is 20. So anchoring is where you're anchored to your initial diagnosis. Confirmation bias, well, I think this is um, anemia. Uh, let's get a CBC. I think the cause of this person's fatigue is anemia. Let's get a CBC. <clears throat> and the, the hemoglobin is uh, 10, which is probably not enough to cause fatigue, but um, I don't think we need to look any further when it's really hypothyroidism. You know, we should get, <clears throat> we should think a little more broadly besides what we, what we first think, the diagnosis we first think about. Search satisfying, the reason I, I had that example of the diabetic foot ulcer, I mean, search satisfying was all over that patient's decision. Uh, we didn't look any further than his foot. So once you find something that could explain the problem, um, I mean, I don't think that foot would explain sepsis. Uh, I suppose it could, but but we didn't look any farther. We should have looked further. Diagnostic momentum, that patient came from the clinic with diabetic foot ulcer on the chart. They were labeled with diabetic foot ulcer. We didn't have to think what's the diagnosis. It's a diabetic foot ulcer. That's what that's on the chart. That's what's been on the chart for the last three times in clinic. They're not getting better. Now they're here, but it's a, diag but it's a diabetic foot ulcer. That's what they have on the chart. It's actually pretty dangerous to put a diagnosis on a chart because then the thinking stops. Nobody else thinks after that. I know you can't see this, um, but this, uh, but I only want you to look at the longest bar. So these are all the causes of diagnostic errors that uh, Gordy Schiff came up with. He's a general internist in Chicago, or was. Now he's in Boston. And he went around to meetings like this and gave everybody a little slip of paper and says, please write down a diagnostic error that you're familiar with, either one you made or one you're familiar with, and then write down what you think caused it. And these are the causes. And the most common cause, which I want to read exactly, is failure slash delay in considering the diagnosis. In other words, you didn't even think about it as a possibility when you saw the patient. It never was on your radar screen. I'll tell you, Fournier's gangrene was not on my radar screen when I saw that patient in the emergency room. And that turns out to be the most common cause. There are lots of others, as you can see, but that turns out to be the most common cause of self, the most common self-perceived cause self-perceive, what do you as the doctor think happened? You might get a different answer if you ask the patient or if you ask the peer reviewer, but if you ask the doctor who made the error, what do you think caused it? That's the most common. There are others like failure to order a needed test, which is really the same thing as failure to think about the, what turns out to be the correct diagnosis. Erroneous test reading, that's what radiologists occasionally do, for example. Too much weight on a competing diagnosis, failed follow-up of an abnormal test, which always kills me because that actually is a common problem. And I think if that was a problem in the airline industry, they would have solved it years ago. But a common problem in medicine is the doctor never gets the test result. That's crazy. That's idiotic. That should never happen. Never, ever, ever should that happen. And yet, it happens a lot. This is a different study that shows the same thing. This time it's labeled premature closure. By the way, on that previous slide, if you look at the, and there's over 100 of these. In fact, at last count, there were 180 of these cognitive biases that. Wikipedia had listed. There's probably only 40 that <clears throat> are fairly common, and uh, but they all tend to lead to this problem of premature closure, meaning when you prematurely close the diagnostic process, you don't think about the diagnosis enough. You don't consider what else could it be. 
So there's a big uh, controversy in uh, this field between um, whether diagnostic errors are caused or result from these biases or whether they result from lack of knowledge and experience. And these two guys are, would tear each other's eyes out, I think, if you put them in the same room um, because they're on two opposite poles. They're both very smart. Uh, they're both in Canada. Pat Crosscarry is an emergency room physician in Halifax, <coughs> Nova Scotia, and Jeff Norman is in Toronto. But they both know a lot about um, cognitive biases and how doctors think. Uh, Pat Crosscarry says, use system two, slow down. Jeff Norman says, use system one, go fast. Uh, Jeff Norman has done all kinds of research on how uh, trainees, particularly medical students and residents, and some trained physicians make uh, diagnoses and what, what um, determines whether they're right or not. And he's convinced that it's knowledge and experience. Uh, Pat Crosscarry says, look, it's obvious, it's cognitive biases, they're just all over the place, and we need to uh, do what's called debiasing, or cognitive forcing functions, which I'll talk about one of those in a minute. We've talked about this, and I think I'm kind of behind, because I want to leave time for questions. Uh, we've talked about the fact that diagnosis is an evolving process, and so is disease. So you may not diagnose this young woman when she's running along the beach, even though she has the problem that's going to kill her eventually. Um, if you see her with fatigue, you might get a CBC and a TSH and think about obstructive sleep apnea. What's the most common cause of fatigue in primary care? Yeah, I would, I, that's what I would say, depression. Uh, a very common cause is obstructive sleep apnea. We always think, you know, anemia, hypothyroidism. That's very rare. It happens, but it's in primary care, it's very rare. In fact, the most common cause of fatigue is probably uh, the most common cause of any symptom, which is undiagnosed, spontaneous resolving, never diagnosed. Uh, benign goes away. We never really find out what it is. So these, I think, are the causes of diagnostic error, lack of knowledge, experience, training. I think that's very important. They're not listed in order of importance, but I, I think this is actually, I'm a little bit inclined to believe Jeff Norman, even though he's not as nice a guy as Pat Crosscarry, but I think he might be right. Um, affective bias, which when we were talking and I asked what, what were the causes of diagnostic errors, these are the causes that came up. Hurry, distraction, fatigue, anger, dislike. Anger is a terrible emotion to have as a physician, and I've had it too often. If you're angry at the patient or angry at another physician or angry at the nurse, look out. That should be your personal red flag. This is very dangerous to be in this emotional state. It's also very dangerous to be distracted and hurried and fatigued, even though we're often asked to work in those situations. And we're terrible at recognizing when we're under those stress stressors. We're terrible at it. We recognize it later, but at the time it's happening, it's just not an issue. I can do this. I'm tough, you know. I'm sure I'm tired, but I can do this. I have to do this. It's our culture. We've talked about cognitive biases. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about physician culture in a minute. System problems, we've talked about that, and diagnosis is difficult. The bottom line is diagnosis can be very difficult. and Sometimes it's very easy, but it can be extremely difficult. Now we're going to talk about prevention. How can we prevent diagnostic errors? And I've got 15 minutes. I want to stop at one so I can take questions. Um, we don't know how to prevent diagnostic errors. Not only do we not know how to define them, 
or how, what causes them, and we don't have good answers to either of those. We don't know how to prevent them. But there's a lot of speculation. There are very few studies on how to prevent diagnostic errors. There are really no clinical trials on how to prevent diagnostic errors. We can get hints about how it, what might work, but we really don't know. So this is a quote from Donald Berwick, who's a pretty famous guy. He used to be the head of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. He's a pediatrician, went to school at Harvard. He's, I believe, still lives in Boston. And I think he's now head of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, IHI. And he was being interviewed by the Boston Globe, and he came up with this quote, which has often been described as a throwaway line, but it's actually uh, one of the favorite quotes among people who study diagnostic errors. Genius diagnosti diagnosticians make great stories, but they don't make great health care. The idea is to make accuracy reliable, not heroic. So the guy on the right is a hero. That's Gupreet Dhaliwal, who's a general internist at UCSF. <clears throat> and w at our annual meeting that I go to called Diagnostic Error in Medicine, he's always the one that's asked to give the, or to do the morbidity and mortality case. And he always gets it right. And it's generally a very difficult, often uncommon disease. Um, and he's in a walking encyclopedia and also a very good teacher. Uh, but there, we can't all be Goop Dhaliwal. Um, so the question is, how does an average physician prevent diagnostic errors? Average like me, or maybe even below average, since half of us are below average. Um, so these are some possibilities. Seek knowledge and ex experience when you have your sixth admission at night say to yourself, oh good, I'm getting more experience. This is a good thing. I should read about this. I should read a lot, and I should get a lot of experience. Document a differential diagnosis using a checklist, which not your memory. Memories are unreliable. Remember that previous quote? The idea is to make accuracy reliable. How to make it reliable. Pilots know how to be reliable. Airline pilots know how to be reliable. They use a checklist. They do not use their memories. People who want to do anything in this world and want to be reliable, anything, go to the grocery store and get all the groceries that you need. Go on a trip and pack everything in your suitcase that you need. Build a skyscraper and get everything in the skyscraper that you need and do it in the right order. Anything like that is done with a checklist if you want to be reliable. If you don't want to be reliable, then do what physicians do. Use your memory. It's our culture to use our memory, not a checklist. Uh, do your own history and physical. This is more of an issue where I work than where you work, because you all do your own histories and physicals, or maybe not. Um, but uh, this means if the resident does the history and physical, you should do it too. Don't rely on the record and characterize symptoms. This is what we learned in medical school, and medical students do this very well, but we've all stopped doing it because we don't think we need to anymore. Characterize symptoms. There are eight characteristics of a symptom. Chest pain, two easy characterizations. Where is it and how long have you had it? I've had chest pain. It's right here, and I've had it for a week. Two A's, aggravating and alleviating factors. What makes it worse? When I get angry at my daughter, it gets worse. What makes it better? When I sit down and relax, it gets better. Two Q's, quality and quantity. What does it feel like? It feels like a tight band around my chest. How bad is it? It can be 10 out of 10, out of 10 sometimes. Too hard to remember. What were you doing when you first got it? I was arguing with my daughter. 
what, were there any associated symptoms? Uh, that's not how I would ask it to a patient. Did you notice anything else? That's how I would ask it. Did you notice anything else? Well, no, what do you mean, doc? What do you mean, did I notice anything else? Well, like a cough or being a short of breath or a fever. So these are the things that we should do and we were taught to do and I almost hesitate to put them up there because they're so basic, but we don't do them. We skip a lot of them because because we think we don't need to do them anymore. That's what medical students do. We don't need to do that anymore. But the trouble is we do need to do that. Follow up patients to prevent harm. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. And follow up patients to learn and calibrate so we don't know how many diagnostic errors we make. We know some of them, but we don't know all of them because we never see some of them again. Be humble and open, not defensive. I was gonna tell a, do a story about Dr. Kitchell. When I was in Lake City, I had a patient that came into the emergency room and I thought he had a stroke. He was an elderly man and uh, I didn't get any labs on him. I thought uh, this was in the days before CT or MRI, at least before CT in Lake City. He's got a stroke. And I don't even remember the symptoms or the findings, but I just was convinced he had a stroke. So I sent him to Ames to see Dr. Kitchell. And Dr. Kitchell got a blood sugar. And the next morning, I got a call from his daughter who said, you know, he didn't have a stroke. She was kind of angry, and I was defensive. But I should have been humble and open. Keep a life list of your mistakes. So birders keep a life list of the birds they've seen. Physicians should keep a life list of their mistakes. We owe it to the patients. We owe it to our patients to keep a life list of what our mistakes were, what we learned, what we thought the diagnosis was, what it really was, when it happened, and what we're gonna do to prevent it the next time. So in the last few years I was in practice, I started using a checklist, diagnostic checklist. I just started writing down a bunch of symptoms that commonly present in primary care, and the list is not infinite. There are about 70 that cover almost all patients that present with an acute undiagnosed problem in primary care. This was, happens to be the shoulder pain checklist, which usually is from a musculoskeletal problem, but there are some really bad causes of shoulder pain, really bad, which I missed. I missed a lung cancer once in a patient that came in with shoulder pain. So the most common cause by the way, this is an order of prevalence. This is number 56 out of 65 checklists. So I've got one for chest pain, abdominal pain, headache, feeling of being cold, weight loss, fatigue, you name it. I mean, almost you name it. Um, unless it's some weird thing like, I've got this funny feeling in my cheek, doc. I don't have one for a funny feeling in my cheek, doc. But, and I also don't have one for rectal bleeding because even though there are lots of causes of rectal bleeding, the workup is the same, and even if you don't think of the cause, you're gonna find it whether you want to or not. But shoulder pain, if you don't look for these bad things, you're not gonna find it. So what do we have here? Cervical radiculopathy, fibromyalgia, biliary disease, myocardial infarction. By the way, the ace of spades means it's a don't miss diagnosis. Don't send the patient home until you've at least thought about these things. Intra-abdominal bleeding. I've had that happen, fortunately, to another physician. I felt so smart. But I would have made the same mistake if I had seen the patient initially. Pneumonia, polymyalgia rheumatica, brachial plexitis, lung tumor, I missed that. Pulmonary embolus ruptured abdominal viscous, ruptured spleen, avascular necrosis of the shoulder head, humeral head, Abdom abdominal malignancy, perigarditis. You know, our tendency is to say, oh, shoulder pain, it's in your shoulder. 
but there, again, there's things in the abdomen that cause shoulder pain. And if you don't go through this list, if I just asked you to generate this list, even as a group, if I was up here with a blackboard and said, okay, all the causes of shoulder pain, and we've got probably 30 or 40 or 50 people here, and we all worked on that for an hour, we would probably not get everything on this list. So we're not reliable. Our memories, and we definitely, if I just asked one physician, you wouldn't get them all. We are not reliable because we rely on our memories, and our memories are not reliable. So I started using this list, and <clears throat> I actually did a study where I had asked physicians to use it. Many physicians were very reluctant to use this in the presence of the patient. But I had some really memorable anecdotes of where it, it would have been, I would have missed it if I had not used it in the presence of the patient. So I had remember two women that I saw several months apart where uh, they were in with abdominal pain and nobody was able to diagnose it. They'd been seen several times before and, and uh, they didn't, um, they seemed like just very straightforward people. <clears throat> and on the, the list of abdominal pain, you know at the top of the list, again, it's in order of prevalence, are things like peptic disease, I think that's first, uh, things like GERD, and then uh, viral gastritis, and then abdominal wall pain. Again, this is primary care prevalence. Down about sixth or seventh on a list that now goes over two pages was uh, depression, uh, or psychiatric parentheses, depression, comma, sexual abuse. So on one of the women, I got to that, and I said, um, depression, sexual abuse? And she said, yes to both. So that was the beginning of a long conversation. The other woman, uh, similar situation, um, uh, I got to that, and she started crying. And she had been very cheerful when in, the, in the interview up to that point. And she, it turns out that her mother died several years ago. She was from China. Her mother died in China. She wasn't there when her mother died, and she felt terribly guilty about this. And that actually is when her abdominal pain started, when her mother died. And it would be wrong to just automatically say, oh, I've got it, but I did have it. You know, we treated her depression, and she got better. Her abdominal pain went away, and uh, she didn't have anything else. She'd already been worked up quite a bit up by that time. So you can do it outside the exam room, and our culture would um, encourage that, but it's actually better, I think, to do it in front of the patient. So this is Atal Gawande, who wrote this book, The Checklist Manifesto, which is a terrific book. I highly recommend it. And in that book, he says, we don't like checklists. They can be painstaking. They're not much fun. They're not much fun. It is very boring to go through a checklist. It somehow feels beneath us to use a checklist in embarrassment, particularly for physicians, it feels beneath us. In fact, it feels like cheating. It runs counter to deeply held beliefs about how the truly great among us, those we aspire to be, handle situations of high stakes and in complexity. There's a lot of resistance about using checklists. Our culture demands, and in some senses our patients demand, that we generate a differential diagnosis from memory. If we don't do it from memory, the patient will lose confidence in us. However, I found that actually, in many ways, it was the opposite. And the way I got around this problem was that I would say, OK, look, this is what I think you've got, and this is what I think we should do. But before you leave the exam room and go down and get your x-ray or go down and get your lab work, I just want to go through this little list. And I would pull out my packet of 70 symptoms, and I would turn to the symptom. I just want to be sure we're not forgetting anything. So I'm going to go through this list. They were fine with that. As long as it, I don't look like a total idiot and say, I have no idea what you've got. I've got to look at this list. No. Say, I think I, this is what you've got. I, this is what we should do. But just uh, to be reliable. 
just to be a little more reliable and make sure I'm not forgetting something, I'm going to pull out this list, which is sort of like a pre-flight checklist, sort of like what an airline pilot would do. And I'm just going to go through it. And it doesn't take long. It, in fact, there are lots of them that you can just immediately skip because they're just totally off the wall for this particular patient. But they have more than once saved my rear end because I did not think of what was on the list. It's one o'clock, one minute after one o'clock. We're going to skip that one. I'll leave that one up. And then I would be happy to take questions. You should challenge me. I think the answer to our prayers is diagnostic checklists. But there are problems. Not all of there are problems with checklists, and I haven't mentioned all of them. So you can ask me about that or anything else. Yes? They are published, but I've uh, made several editions since they were published. They were published in an article in Academic Medicine, and they're in an um, appendix to that. But if you write down your email address on a little piece of paper and give it to me, along with your name, I will send you an electronic version. And if you give me your snail mail address, I will send you a hard copy. Yeah? I was going to say, I was going to ask the same question similar to that. Never having used the electronic medical record, at least you have the screen in front of you, which patient doesn't necessarily see, which can give you a cue to your checklist, um, et cetera. And I want to make one comment, and that is not only in medicine, but how many times have many of us thought, I should have thought of that? <laughs> that, that is a very common quote. And the, what, what, uh, the common quote is, I just didn't think of it. I just didn't think of it. I just didn't think of the diagnosis that it turned out to be. It wasn't on the radar screen. And that's happened to me many times. Yes? Where does uh, stereotyping or profiling fit in this, particularly in relation to age, racism, socioeconomic status, and so on? Right. So the, the question is, where does uh, uh, profiling enter in? Uh, there are some biases that are named after profiling. So there's the psych out bias which says that, oh, this is a psych patient. They don't have anything. They're, they're just depressed or they're just anxious. Uh, alcohol, uh, obesity, um, you know, are, are big um, factors against taking a patient seriously. The, the patient that comes into the ER with a migraine, you know, it's their 20th time. Is there a chance they have a brain tumor? Pretty low. How low? One in a million, probably. I mean, we're talking really low in that situation. But it's possible. It's possible. I, I remember a patient that I had that was terribly anxious. Uh, every little thing. I mean, uh, it, was, it was nuts trying to take care of her. And one time she came in and said, I think there's something caught in my tooth. It feels like this little thing that's jabbing me. So I looked in her mouth. and didn't see much, and then decided to take a little more thorough look. And she had this bristle from her toothbrush that was jabbing her in the gum. <laughs> and as soon as I took that out, she was cured. So I mean, any other day that she came in, I would have found nothing. But it's a danger. OK. Thank you.